All right, it's 9.50, let's start. So uh, this, is the, uh, this is the session, uh, uh, the second session that we are actually having a lecture. And uh, today we're going to actually start doing some uh, uh, coding and see how we can actually start programming. Um, all those people uh, who have Mac computers, I again strongly suggest uh, if your Mac computer is not one of those M1 mobile processor thingies, uh, please uh, follow the Fusion thingy that I put over there. Put a virtual machine and try to have your Visual Studio because it's going to help you a lot later in, a, in, in, a, in, in college. Um, again, if the time comes and we want to do Xcode and things like that, there are actually subjects for that, but the focus of what we do is on... Visual Studio, and I, and I uh, try to be as helping as I can with Xcode, as much knowledge that I have, which is very limited. So, I apologize if I uh, don't know it that well. That's number one. Number two, workshop zero that I gave you. Okay, that's something that I want you to just set up your computer with, even incorrectly. So I don't mind if your computer is not set up properly and it doesn't work and you cannot work with GitHub. It doesn't matter. From now on, your focus should be on programming. Okay? That workshop zero, whenever, and I really ask you to do this, and I'm going to demonstrate over here again now uh, using... Uh, Microsoft Teams and tell you how to book an appointment, although I already said it over there, but you need to uh, learn these things quickly, okay? First of all, install the application for Microsoft Teams. It is extremely important to have the application installed, not use the web version, because the web version doesn't have the, act, uh, the, the capability of uh, screen control. If something goes wrong with your setup, I cannot take over your computer and fix it, okay? But if you put the app, then I can. That's number one. Number two, I want you to, if you have any problem dealing with Git and pushing and pulling and all the nonsense that I talked about, I want you to book a one-to-one one, 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 one appointment with me, okay? Have your computer, set it up. Uh, have your computer ready, not from your mobile, from Starbucks, at some place quiet that you can pay attention to me and you have your computer on so I can help you. Again, when the time passes by and we learn about this thing, working with Git becomes like taking a bus to school. It becomes just one tool that you are using to do your everyday thing. And as you start learning how to work with it, you will see you're going to use in all your courses because it is an amazing tool for anything that is supposed to keep track of progress of things. Anything, if you're writing an essay and you want to have the, the process of writing your essay kept track on, you can use it. If you are doing an animation, you can use it. If anything you want, it, it, it works for it, okay? So, again, I do not want your focus to be Git and GitHub. Git and GitHub is just a tool for you to be able to do things comfortably. And I just hit you with it first on a first day. So you just do setup regardless of what programming is. Now we are doing programming, OK? So <clears throat> how to book an appointment with uh, Microsoft Teams. Open your Microsoft Teams and log into uh, uh, your Seneca account. It's a new, so when you log in, it says there, there's a new Teams, which one you want to use, and use a new one or the old one, potatoes, potatoes. Doesn't make that much of a difference, okay? So many of you have seen the IPC144 NBB office. If you, go to, if you go to the organization that we have, so again, I'm gonna open different places and, and, and show you these. So if we go to IPC 144, NBB only, that's us. And if you come down over here, Office Hand Help, if you click over here, it actually takes you to Microsoft Teams. 
and if you don't have it, it tells you to download and brings up this one that is completely empty at the moment. Okay, so um, uh, I will. Um, I don't know if you are already added over here or not, but if you're not, you can request it, uh, and you will be added to it. So first time you click on it, uh, it, it tells you if you want to join, and you say join the team, and it sends me a request, and you're in the in the team. So this has nothing to do with booking an appointment. So when I say office and help, when you click and it brings you to Teams, that has, this has nothing to do with this. You can post a problem that you have and others can help. And I can help. So anything you post over here, everybody will see. And it's a good thing. That's how open source development works. Please do not put the entire uh, uh, project over here uh, and say I have problem with this just put the piece of code that doesn't work and say this part I'm doing the loop and doesn't work anybody knows what's the problem and they'll let you know about it the next thing how to book an appointment we ran into some server error functions might not work right now but you can continue using the app okay let's see if if it's going to work or not so you click on calendar and when you click on calendar, this is my, I even put my commute in here. So to make sure which times I'm available or not. For example, somebody wanted help at the time over here, but it was too late. Like, again, if you book an appointment half an hour from now, probably I won't get it. Even if, so the best thing for me to see when the appointment is set is when you book it 48 hours in advance. So say you want to book an appointment with me, you click on new meeting. Then on new meeting, add a title over here on what you want to do. Okay, so uh, say I'm going to call it help with GitHub. It's extremely important for me to know what you want help with. Okay, then require attendees. Now you can either do it here or go to the scheduling assistant, or you can directly go to the scheduling assistant and work. But this scheduling assistant is where you are supposed to do your appointments. So you click on scheduling assistant, and in here you add, can I have someone's ID please? Anyone? HC? C-H-A-N-G. Oh. H A N G 67. If it is connected, it has a server error now. <laughs> but if it doesn't have a server error, usually it gives. Like if you type Fardad, you're going to see my face coming in here immediately. And then you click on it. Let me just switch to the other one and then just see what happens. I'm going to pause the recording. This is, by the way, called Murphy's Law. Like this. So because now, now it's recording, because it, uh, the con there's a connection problem now, if you go to your subject and log into your course, that is IPC 144, if you click on Faculty Information, Office, and Help, then you click on Faculty Information. In here, it says Scheduling Assistant tab. If you click over here, this comes up. I'm not going to let it run, but it shows exactly what you're supposed to do. Go through it, and it tells you. I actually had the lab assistants at the time. Peter was an assistant. I actually set it up. Let me pause it so we don't have two things recorded. So this actually takes you through it and tells you exactly how to book an appointment. So please follow this and, um, and, uh, and book an appointment with me. So um, let's go back here. I, can I copy that link? Let me copy link address. There you go. So what I'm going to do in here, in the office, in here that is our or IPC144 help thingy. Need help with workshop zero. Thank you, somebody actually put that thing on. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna say over here, uh, book an appointment with me uh, following these 
instructions. And I'm gonna put the link over there. So and I'm gonna and I'm gonna turn this to an announcement and I'm gonna say how to book an appointment. Okay? So fail to send because we are not connected, but I will as soon as I get connected, I'm gonna send it. Okay? So you follow what I'm saying, right? So please follow those instructions and, and you'll be done. So uh, I cannot put m enough stress on this, but approximately 85% of people who are asking for help did not follow the instructions exactly because you're not just used to it. That's something that comes with computer programming. You need to be exact. I mentioned that and I'm going to mention it again and again. You need to be exact, okay? If you are not exact, then and remember, uh, if you are doing something, you need to, if you are doing something other than I ask you to do, in a way, you need to know what you're doing. If you are getting help from anywhere and, and doing your code, I don't care, as long as you know what's happening. If you give me a code and I'm going to tell you, explain what did you do over here and say, mm, I don't know, then that's going to be a zero for me, okay? Please be aware. I don't care if you get help, that's how we learn, okay? But as long as you know what is happening and you can explain it to me in detail, all right? And those are the code reviews I initiate. So I'm going to ask you after two, three workshops, you and I will going to have a code review at this time. Then you and I will go and I'm going to get the three workshops and I'm going to go through them with you and I'm going to tell you, okay, explain how things are happening over here. So, all that done, let's start uh, going back to our C thingy, okay? So, as I mentioned, the first few times, maybe the first half of the semester, I'll create the thing from scratch so you see how Visual Studio is created. The, the project is created for it. I had a coffee somewhere. There we go. So, the very first thing that you do, you create a new project. An empty project which provides no starting files. Click on next. You select the directory in your repository. Now, I have a repository for the notes, so I'm going to go to Seneca, IPC 144, and don't tell me that we don't have it here. Okay, so oh, oh, good thing, so you're going to see. I don't have the repository here, so I'm going to actually clone it. Uh, because this is the first time I'm using this computer. So I'm going to go to Seneca IPC 144, IPC 144 GitHub. Because it's the first time, I do this only once. I will copy the SSH because I installed the SSH and all the good stuff. Now I'll come over here, right click, and I'm going to go Git clone. And I'm going to clone the repository that I have on GitHub. Therefore, whatever I do in here can be easily pushed to GitHub. Now I'm going to go to IPC 144 only, notes, and that was January 11th. This one, uh, and I'm going to just select the folder. So notes is going to be the folder. The project will be 02, January 18th. And always, 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 always check this, okay? Place the solution and project in the same directory. What is the difference between the solution and the project? A solution is a set of projects. You are creating an e-commerce application, you create a solution, and then you do the web, the inventory, the point of sale, everything in one. So you have five different projects. We don't do that. We write a loop that brings five numbers. So for us, our solution is the project. So check that one not to have nested uh, uh, directories. Um, what is a directory in everyday term? System. No, no. What is a directory? What is other, another name? Folder. folder. So remember, folder. Okay. So I call it directory. You hear it folder. Remember, it's folder. Okay. And that's how I teach. I go, um, <clears throat> did I tell you about the rule? How do I teach? How do I? I didn't tell you about the. Okay. So I start from the first victim. I ask the question. I take the answer. I go to the next one. And I keep going like that. If you are not in the mood, you don't want to answer, you simply say pass and it goes to the next person. Nobody answers and you have to wait for them to answer. If you hear three passes, it means they're in trouble. If you know the answer, now you can come to rescue. And you can say, 
I can answer, okay? If your answer is very smart and nice, you get bonus marks for your midterm. And if we are after midterm, you get bonus marks for your final. So I'm gonna say 2% to your midterm if it's amazing. If it's just a good answer, you get half a percent. If it's a good answer, you get 1%, something like that. And you do it only once per session, okay? So you cannot answer 50 times and get half a, <laughs> half a mark for your midterm. So that's how the game works, okay? So he, has, he had the first question, so the next one is gonna be Milady over here, and we're gonna keep going like that, all right? All right? All right, so, so then I create the, the project, and that creates a directory for me inside the notes, ready to go. It tells me to update. Please update your Visual Studio, okay? I'm gonna do it later. So right-click on source files, add new item, and I'm gonna go to code C++, and prg.c is my friend, because we are learning C. C++ is a superset of, is a superset of C language. What does it mean superset when I say superset? Um, more, uh, advanced, uh, more advanced, more detailed. So anything you do in C++, in C, C++ can do because it has, it has C in its belly. And how does it recognize that it should compile as C, not C++, when you do dot C, okay? But when you are working on matrix, on matrix, you are literally compiling your code with a C compiler. Here on, on, uh, on our desktops, when you're doing Visual Studio Code or you are doing, uh, uh, um, sorry, if when you're doing Xcode or you're doing Visual Studio, you are actually using a C++ compiler to compile your C. But on uh, matrix, you type GCC, which is essentially a C compiler, okay? It's a GNU C compiler, that's why they call it GCC. All right, and so to start our pro any program, the very first thing that we do is include IO stream. Oh, <laughs> this is C, C language, sorry, uh, stdio.h. And that's, we're gonna do that in OP244, <laughs> that's, yes. Pass this subject, come to OP244, I'll explain. Okay. So standard input output, you do that. Then int main, you write uh, what originates everything, and it's void, which means we don't pass anything to it. And we have a return zero at the end. If you do this, that's an empty program. Always start it like this, with your eyes closed, finish this, then think what you want to do. So you don't forget the return zero at the end. If you write this like English, when you start from the beginning and you put the full stop at the end, you're gonna make a mistake. You always write the whole block in which you want to write the program in, then you fill it. Like that, you can keep, you don't need to keep track if I closed my block or not, okay? A block of code is anything between an open curly bracket and a closed curly bracket. A block of code can be a function, in this case it's a function, what is the name of this function? What is the name of this function? Main. Main, it's main function. What does main return? What does it main return? When you see main at left side of it, what do you see? If you write any code, it will... At left side of the word main, what do you see? Integer. Thank you, so it returns an integer. That's all we need to know. So this function returns an integer and receives nothing. Okay, so, and that's what the main program looks like. If you are using Xcode, when you create your C project, it puts lots of stuff over here. It writes over here int argc, and then writes over here uh, a character uh, argv, something like that. That's too rich for our blood. That's OOP345. Okay, so, so just delete all that and write void instead. Okay, that's what you get in, 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 in uh, uh, Xcode that we don't need. So all that is changed to void, which means I'm not passing anything. Okay, as we said, 
C language is a set of functions. You keep writing different functions and you keep writing sub, sub recipes and then you put all these sub recipes together and you create a big recipe. That's how everything uh, works. Uh, that's how uh, the, the C language works. So we, and we learned that using that title Schmeidel thingy in, in workshop one. Uh, so you've seen it. And I extended the due date one day for those people who were late. I, I think you've noticed. So uh, to, to see what the due date is, you always put a dash two on the end of the submission command. And one more time to, to explain that one. Uh, when you log into Matrix, you install PuTTY. And don't use any other thing other than PuTTY unless you're using a Mac, which the terminal is a PuTTY thing by itself. So, and you uh, enter your password. And then you issue the command. So you say far.sulimanlu slash submit 144 workshop one part one. You put a dash two over here and it tells you what the due date for it is. So remember, anytime you want to know what is the due date, don't send me a message. What is the due date for this workshop? Write the command for submission, add a dash two at the end, and it tells you when the due date for it is. If you need an extension, if you need an extension, extensions can be granted. You can actually ask me. You don't, for uh, workshops, because I don't, I, I don't accept late, late submissions, I, I allow you to ask for extensions a few times. So you can ask me for that. I couldn't do, I can't do this. I had a problem with it. Can I get an extension? I'll give you an extension, but you have to give me two things over here. First, what is your subject? Because I'm teaching three, five different things. So you tell me I'm in IPC, and you have to tell me how many days additional to the due date you want. So how many days I should add to the due date? You cannot tell me I want the workshop, I, I, want, I want extension till Wednesday. That, that's not how the submission works. You have to tell me I want three days extension. So you do the math, find out how many extra days you want based on the due date that is currently there, and I'll grant you the submission so you can give it uh, to me on time. So, now that's the pause on that. Let's talk about uh, uh, the computer memory. Okay? Let's talk about the computer memory. If I ask you, if I asked you, add three plus four, okay? You're going to tell me seven. But how did you do that? Okay? So that's what it, the computer programming is about, to think about the details of every single thing to do, you do right to the most, uh, uh, right to the most uh, small detail. That's how programming works. So when I tell you, add three to, to, to four, okay? So I'm going to say three plus four. If I tell you three plus four, for you to be able to answer me, if you don't have any short-term memory, can you answer me? If I tell you, add, uh, give me the sum of three and four. As soon as I tell you that, you forget. Can you answer me? No. So without knowing, our computer submits those information into some piece of memory, holds it, and then it can go back over there and do the process as we do, right? Those memories that we keep stuff so the computer remembers what it's supposed to do, we call them variables. Variables in your program remember what is the data so you can process it later. Do we understand this? Okay? So variable are variables are what we hold the data in so we can process it later. Are we okay with all this? Okay. We have only two types of variable in C language. Two major types of variables. Two major categories, I correct myself, of variables. And that is it. And anybody tells you otherwise, is they are lying through their teeth. Okay? We only have two major types. Integrals. Anybody knows what is an integral? Should I? You know what an integral number is? You remember algebra? Integral number? 
integrals? Anybody knows what integrals are? Integrals are numbers who don't have partial parts, integers. Okay? Integers. So 10 is an integral, right? 952 minus 5, 5 billion. These are all integer values. So that's one category. Done. Finished. We have nothing else to talk about it. The second one are what we call real numbers. Real numbers are those who have partial parts. 1.32, right? 3.14159265, whatever, okay? So stuff like that. So when you, what? So that's the only two different things that we have. Done. There is no other thing in C language. We cannot hold the letter A inside C language. There is no such thing. We're going to play some tricks to do so. I'll show you. Okay? We're going to play some tricks to do so. I'll show you. But there is no such thing as characters. You cannot hold Fardad in a program. You can't. You have to hold Fardad in some other way and ask the computer to show it that way. So just remember that. All we have in C language are integers and uh, real numbers, integral real numbers. In, in C language, they say integers, floating points. Why they call it floating point? Because you have a number and a, and a dot floats in it somewhere. Okay, that's why they call it a floating point number. So <clears throat> what are the two uh, most commonly used types? One, as you see over there at line two, INT. That's integer. So the most common integer that you can put. And all these things are like containers. So all the variables are like containers. So uh, this is empty. Do you mind if I touch it? OK. These two are containers, two variables. They get different amount of data in them because they are designed that way. OK? So you're going to see when we create a data type, that data type can hold an integer, but it has a limit. It has certain amount of space that it can go up to and certain amount of space that it can go down to. Any variable, any variable in C language, any variable in C language, before I write anything, I want you to know how it works. So any variable in C language acts as follows. I'm so sorry for my uh, lack of artistic values. <laughs> this is the best I can do, OK? So actually, let me make it better. Maybe I can do it like this. There you go. That's better. <laughs> OK, and then I'm going to do it like this. So here is where I have. Zero. Here is where I have positive maximum. Here is where I have minimum maximum number that I can get. Right? For example, the smallest integer you can have, the smallest integer you can have can only hold 127 in it, not more than that. And the smallest value it can hold is minus 128, which means if you put in it positive, if you, if you put 100, so 0 is here. If it reaches to 127, if you add 1 to it, it jumps to the next side. It becomes negative 128, and it goes like that. So that's how it works in anything. So if you pass it, they call it overflow. It will not have its real value anymore it's going to lose its value and go bad. So they call it essentially an overflow. So you have to know what the size of the variable is before you use it. The smallest integer can go up to 128 minus 127. Now, as you remember, when we talked about bits, we, so, we show how many different bits we can hold, right? And we said when it's 8, it's 255, 256 different things. Now. Did I talk about how many fingers I have? Okay, and I said with 0 to 9, 
I put the zero over here, it starts from minus five, goes up to positive four. That's why always the biggest number is one less than the smallest number. Okay? So you all, you all remember when I said 10 fingers, right? Okay, so it's the same thing over here and it works that way, okay? So what I want you to, uh, yeah, so that's all. So yeah, that's it. Now, int, the int value, so uh, the, to kind of get a ballpark of what is the maximum number you can hold in each, uh, the smallest one was eight, so um, that's 255 and zero, right? Two, zero and 255. You divide 255 by two, then that becomes if it's negative and positive. If you only hold, hold positive, it's zero up to something. But again, if, if you bring the zero up here, obviously you have more numbers to go through. But if you pass the positive side, it jumps back to zero again. Remember, it's a circle. Okay, why? Because the sky is high. I don't want to go through it, but that's the fact. So if, if you have a number and you keep going and you see suddenly it became negative, it means you passed through its limit. Remember that. Now let's see what is the syntax. So a variable is written as type of the variable and then you name it something. Okay? So in here, I'm going to call it h, OK? Or let's call it num, a number, whatever it is. So semicolon is a very important thing in, in C language. That means end of a statement. So when you write int num, it means I have a number uh, that is, uh, I'm supposed to hold an integer in it, OK? And then you write, say, double dnum, now I have a number that is a real number. So the most common integral number to use in C language is int. The most common real number to use in C language is double. Okay? Why it's called double, we don't care. Just know it. Okay? So when you say double, I can actually, so in, if I want to, now I can set these things to values. I can actually say over here a num is set to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's an integral number. And I can say dnum is set to 1, 2, 3, 4, point five, six, seven, eight. OK? Are we OK with this? Now, obviously, if I make it reverse by mistake, if I put the real number inside num that is integer. Let's actually call that inum. It has nothing to do with apple. It means integer number. <laughs> OK, so inum. OK, so in inum, if I by mistake put 1, 2, 3, 4, point, 5, 6, 7, 8 in inum, because inum doesn't have the capability to hold the partial part, the partial part will drop. And only the fixed part will go in there no matter how close it is to the top. So if I have 3.9999999999, and by mistake I put it in an integer, 3 will go in there. The partial part will drop because it doesn't have the capability. If you put an integer inside the double number, what happens? It adds a point zero to it. So if I put 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in denom, I'm going to have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, point zero. OK, are we good? Andres? No, not at all. Yes, not at all. Because sometimes, many times you intend to do so. OK, many times you intend to do so. So how do we show these numbers on a screen? Like if I want to actually display these things, how do we show them? We know that we can show these, we can sh print stuff on a screen using a command called print formatted, print F, right? So that's what we do. So we write over here, printf, OK? <clears throat> and I'm going to write over here, integer value. And I'm going to put a column like that. And in here, I'm going to say double value. And I'm going to put a comma afterwards. And I'm going to put double value. And 
and then I'm going to go to new line. So if I run this program, obviously nothing's going to get printed <laughs> because I'm printing those things. So it's going to say integer value this, double value that, right? Now, <clears throat> we can put placeholders over here for what we want to print. Placeholders start with percent sign. So if you put a percent over there, it becomes a placeholder where you want to insert something when you are printing. So I can put a percent over here. Now, that becomes the tricky part, <laughs> okay? So let me, I don't know why this happened, but they have percent D for the integer. It has nothing to do with double. It means decimal, okay? <laughs> they have percent D to put that one, okay? And for integer, and they have percent LF for the double. That's what it is, okay? Now, instead of double, but that's okay, that's fine. Now, after this, so now if I print this, this is what's going to come up. Some garbage values over there. Why? Because I didn't mention what I want to place for those things. Okay, so what do I want to place? I put it after here. So what I want to place the percent D is inum, and I want to, what I want to place in percent LF is D num. So this is how it works. <clears throat> the first one, the first one will go to the first one, and the second one will go to the second one. Remember, computer has zero programming languages. They have zero intelligence, which means if you do something wrong, they're going to print you something wrong. So if I put the integer printed as a double or print a double, print it as an integer, gobbledygook's going to come out. It's, uh, it's not predictable, okay? Always remember that when you are actually printing stuff, they have to match the, the thing. So now in here, if I run the program, the result is going to happen like this. Are we good? Now, when you look at it, you see it's going to add two zeros over here. We don't care about that later. Because this is print formatted, there are that percent and D, you see that? You can put many things between the percent and D to tell to the printf how I want that print that uh, integer to be printed. I want that integer to be printed in five spaces, right justified, and I want the empty spaces to be filled with. You can do all these things. We don't care for now. We just want to print them out. <laughs> That's all. Okay? Or you can simply say over here, I want two digits after the decimal point to get printed. And when it's printed, I want it to be right justified in 50 spaces. You can do that. No problem. And it's very easy. I don't want to bother you with it now. Just we want to see how the things are going to come out. Are we okay down to this point? All right? You probably already know this, but there's something that that we need to understand. So this is, so I'm going to say over here, I'm just going to say, uh, I'm going to save this. So it's going to be A, and I'm going to call it variable. Integer and real variables, or integer and double variable, dot C. And I stop it, and I'll go to the next one. So this is how I do. So you'll see a in, in GitHub, when you go on GitHub, when you, and I strongly suggest you actually clone this repository too. Don't edit it. Don't do anything. Do any, don't do any commit or anything. Just pull it in your computer so you're going to have all the notes. And you can copy it in your own directory and then play with it. Because you don't have push permission to, uh, to this repository, clone it. And every time that I teach something new, you just pull. It brings all the new stuff in, okay? And if you follow the instructions properly, then you can actually double-click on README file, and your 
browser is going to open it, and you can actually go over there and listen to the recording. So you have everything. You can have everything on your computer. Again, you can literally clone what I have up there. Anyways, so going back over here, calculations. So now I have integer num. Then I'm going to create another integer. So I'm going to now I'm going to call this one integer n1 number one and integer n2, that's another number. And in here, I'm going to have another one integer, I'm going to call it sum. Okay? All the, the, the basic math stuff is covered in here. What, the basic math, what are the four basic max math stuff, the math operations that we have? Addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, right? Okay, we have one more over here that is modulus, mod, okay? That is the remainder of the division. That is, that we have to, okay? So if you want to know what is the, uh, the, re the, the remainder of uh, the result of a division to something from something, you can actually find that, okay? So how we can actually do this? But of course, that's not going to work for doubles <laughs> because double division goes partial, right? It's only for integers that we have a mod, remember that. So what you do needs to make sense, okay? When I tell you something, use judgment to see if it makes sense or not. So now I can say n1 is set to 2 or 3, the, the example that I have. n2 is set to 4. And in here I'm going to say sum is set to n1 plus n2. And in here I'm going to say the sum of percent D and percent D is percent D. And in here I'm going to say N1, N2, and sum. Are we okay with this? Are we okay with this? So when you run the program, what it, what's going to happen, so at this stage first, declarations will happen. So the compiler will know what type of memory it has for this program. Then I put values in those memories. Then I do some calculation. Then I'll print what the results are. And therefore, when I run this program, the, the answer is going to be control F5 executes and runs it. It says the sum of 3 and 4 is 7. Okay? F10 is your friend. When you press F10, the compiler the IDE walks through it. That's one of the features of IDE. It actually tracks your code. So I'll do F10, and I'm going to bring this one at left and bring the output at right. Now I'm going to press F10 again. And as you see, all these things happen at once. Bring the mouse over here. That's the value N1 has, some garbage. Bring the value over here. That's the v N2 has. It's just zero by chance. Sum is 474, just by chance. When you declare a variable, what does happen? Essentially, inside your executable, your program, a piece of memory is assigned to you, and it's labeled with the name of the variable that you're putting over there. Because it's a piece of memory of your computer that is being used by 50,000 programs, you have no idea what's in it. It's garbage. So all the values will contain garbage after they are created. But as soon as the assignment happens, as you see in here when I go F10 and I pass through it, if I look at N3, it has 3 in it now. Then I do another F10, N2 has 4 in it now. And now I have sum over here, it's 474. As soon as it happens, it becomes 7. And now it's going to get printed. So do we understand how we go step? So this actually walks through F7, sorry, F10, compiles and runs and walks through your code so you can see what the sequence of that. But as the code gets more complicated, you will see that it, this helps you to understand how programs run. Are we okay down to this point? Yes. Yes, that's, that's called initialization. Okay. I'll explain that in the next thing. What is the difference between initialization and setting? And if you understand now today, in OOP244, you're going to be one week ahead.
okay, <laughs> the next semester. I'll explain that <clears throat> when the time comes, okay? So are we okay down to this point? Are we good? All right. I want you to understand something about assignment. Assignment at, in computer science has two, two uh, in, in any computer program, it has two stages. It doesn't happen in one shot. What happens is that first the right side of the assignment is calculated, the result is found, then the assignment happens and the left side is overwritten. Got it? Therefore, you can write things in a program that is absolute nonsense in mathematics. I'll explain. So, in mathematics, if I say A is set to A plus 1, what does it mean? You say A goes by A, 0 is 1. What the heck? Right? That doesn't make sense. That's algebra. In computer science, you do it differently. If you follow the steps properly, if I say A is equal to A plus 1, first of all, I need to know what A was before this. So I'm going to write over here A is, say, 5. OK? And I'm going to put a semicolon so we know. So when you are saying A is 5, there you go. <laughs> OK, so now if I do it the way I explained, first the right side happens. Right? What is A? 5. 5 plus 1, 6. Now 6, A will be set to 6. So after this, the value of A will be 6. So it adds 1 to it. You follow? That's how we count things in C language. If you want something to have as you want to know how many times, you do that. And it keeps counting. it. So remember, unlike algebra, the, in a programming language, if I actually If I write sum is equal to sum plus 10, if I do something like that, and say printf, now the value of sum is percent %d, and I'll go to new line, and in here I'm going to put the value of sum. So now let's walk through this one. When I run the program, we know how everything happens over here. It's done and good. But when it comes over here, sum is 7. That is 10. If you highlight it and look at it, the result is 17, correct? So 17 is going to go to sum. Therefore, sum will be 17. You add a 10 to it. Do we understand how expressions work? Right? Are we OK with this? Are we OK? Are we OK? All right. So that's going to be B expressions. And <clears throat> expressions works exactly like math works. So which means if I write something like this, By the way, asterisk is, multi is multiplication, okay? Asterisk, because you cannot write x, so asterisk is mu multiplication. If I do something like this, uh oh change the wrong file. So if I do something like this in here, If I say I'm 
I'm not going to put it sum over here because it's not sum anymore. I'm going to call it value, val. So what is going to be the output of this program? Or let's put it over here, actually. That's obvious. What is going to be the output of this program? Let's put it this way. OK? If I do it like this, what's going to happen? In math, what has priority? Which operators have pri priority? Multiplication and division, right? They come, and other than that, it's left from to right, left to right. So when I want to do this, it's not going to be 14. It's not going to be n plus n1 plus n2, 7, then multiply by 2, 14. It's going to be n2 multiplied by 2, that is 8, then plus 3, 11. Do we understand this? Are we okay with this? Okay, that's going to be in your first quiz, so careful, okay? And parentheses work exactly the same way. So if I run, if I do it like this, so now this one I'll put parentheses and the other one I don't. So if I run this program like this, the first one's going to be 11 and the second one's going to be 14 and I forgot to put a new line. Are we okay with this? Right? Yes. Oh, one more time. What, what? Repeat that question one more time. I didn't understand the question. Uh, and wait, 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 wait. Yes. Integers, right? mm -hmm. But in here we only put in one integer, but we get like the. What do you mean two integers? Like uh, person D, it's only one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I have only one value. You want me to print them all? I can do that. Okay. <laughs> well, whatever I want, I print that. It's there is no reason for it. I okay. So I can do this. I can do this if you want to. I can say. The result of percent percent D plus percent D multiply by two is, and then I'll put over here N one and two. Oh not this, sorry, sorry, sorry. N one and two and val. If I do this, there's absolutely no, no problem. It will work. So, so th now if I, if I do it as follows, then this one's going to go. Then this one's going to go here. This one's going to go here. And this one's going to go here. And as a result, the output is going to be more fancy. But again, it's a computer program. You can write whatever you want, your choice. Why did I print that one? Because I wanted to print them all. Why didn't I do it? Because I didn't want to. It's as simple as that. And sadly, when you are doing a program, sadly, when you are writing a program, usually 90% of the time, you have no choice. You are simply translating someone else's someone else's wishes into a programming language. And you have to follow exactly what they are saying while you are programmers. After three, four, five, ten years of programming, five years of programming, then you become a system analyst. When you become a system analyst, then your choices are coming in. You are still doing the client's wishes, but you are translating client's wishes into pieces of code and referring to programs to write. So you have kind of uh, say on how things are implemented, OK? So keep that in mind.
So that's that. Uh, so this one is B. Uh, didn't I? I did expressions, right? B expressions. So why is it not there? Oh, I did I do C++ by mistake? Yeah, I have to fix that. So this one's going to be C expressions continued. Dot C. Um, I'll rename the other one to C. If it's if you see any CPP extension, it means it it means I made a boo boo. Uh, rename it to C and remind me of it to do it for you. Now this is all good, but how can I actually interact with user and ask the user to actually give the information to me? How can I do that? Inside the main? Yeah, but, but ah, it's a actually a very good question over here. I haven't taught you yet how functions talk with each other. I need you to understand one important aspect of computer programming. We have two worlds. As a programmer, we have to think about these two worlds. World of human beings and world inside the computer. Inside the computer, functions can pass information to each other and get it from each other. That has nothing to do with the human world. So the way functions give things to each other that I did not explain to you yet, the way functions pass things to each other, we have nothing to do. We cannot give anything to it. So if a function wants to receive a value from another function, if we don't do, we, we have no interaction. For us to pass information to the computer has nothing to do with what a computer, what, what a function re receives or returns. What a function receives or returns is only with its own fellows, not us. With its own, with the functions in the same program. One function cast, can pass a value to another function or receive a value from another function. That has nothing to do with us. The world outside talking to a computer, sending its stuff into our program, is done through a very complex and extremely excruciating process that is beyond our bachelor's degree at Seneca. That's why they actually wrote a function that it does it for us. So we don't write it. Okay? That function has a specific format. Because what you type on the computer, and I want you to please be extremely Listen to me carefully. Let's put it like this. Listen to me carefully now. Programmers are sane human beings. Users are dumb, idiot people. That's the default of the system. It's not a joke. A user who works with your computer does crazy stuff that you cannot imagine. That's why literally Programs and functions written to deal with users are called foolproof applications because we think all users are fools. And when you are testing your program, you are the fool. And you will do things that you won't believe you did. So you have to always have that as the fault of your system. So when I tell you, assuming the user is sane, which means we assume that user actually, when I tell the user, please enter the number of tables in the classroom. A normal user will count the tables and write over there 12. But you know what the person's going to do? Write coffee and hit enter. They do that because they think coffee can be on a table. I heard a table. Let me answer coffee. They do that. You have to. Be ready for that. We'll teach you how to do it later. But for now, at this stage, we assume users are not cuckoo banana people. They are actually sane people that when you ask them to enter your age, they're not going to enter the mother of their 
car. They're going to actually enter their age. Are we okay? All right. Having that in mind, this is how we receive information from users. Printf is to print something formatted. When you, when this, when the, when the computer tries to understand what you're saying, it scans your data entry into the keyboard. After scanning, it translates it to what it needs to be. Okay? So, what you are typing on your keyboard are merely some characters. When you write the number 12 over there, number 12 is not 12 in a variable. In a variable, you know what a 12 is. We did the bit pattern from uh, 0 to 14, 15, to 16, to 15, uh, 0 to, to F. And I, and, and I made a mistake. You saw bit pattern. That's how it's kept in your data. So when you write 12, the function, the complicated function, will read that 12, understands, because you told them it's an integer, it will convert it to a bit pattern and put it in a variable. It's going to do it for us. How do we use it? This is how we do it. I want you to appreciate that using the function is not difficult. What the function is doing is crazy. And you don't know. It's exactly like driving a car. Driving a car is not difficult. But if you want to know what happens behind the seat scene when you just press that pedal and the car goes, it's a crazy thing. Like it's millions of things are happening in there for that car to move. Okay? I just want you to appreciate that. This function is called scanf. Its job is to scan. So in here, I want to read number one and number two from. So I'm going to say scan formatted. The other one was print formatted is scan formatted. The, the thing is the same. So you write over here what you want to read. So it, nothing is printed over here. In this scanf, you're going to tell to the C program how to scan the keyboard. I want to receive an integer. I'm going to say, you know how it, an integer is represented, percent %d. It means get an integer and put it into this sign ampersand ampersand okay i want you to name it properly even if you don't understand what the heck it means you know what a unary operator is right a unary operator is a, a, an operator that comes before a number and it has only like minus three that's a unary operator a binary operator receives two things like a plus b plus now is a binary operator so it's two things Okay, A plus B. But if you only say plus A, that's a unary operator. Okay, so if this ampersand is used as a unary operator, as a prefix in front of a variable, you call it address of. Remember, you don't need to know why you are saying that. Just say it. When the time comes, you will see it's going to say the truth will set you free. It's going to set you free when the time comes. So when you write that, so you're going to say, Scan the number and put it in the address of N1. Okay? It's exactly like I'm an Amazon delivery guy. I'm going to give a package and they say, get this package and deliver it to the address of. They put the address of me over there. So they deliver the package to me. That's how Scanf works. Scans it from the keyboard and puts it in the address of N1. Therefore, N1 will be set to that value. And then in here, I'm going to say scanf, again, percent %d, and put it in address of n2. And now I'm going to say sum is n1 plus n2. And I'm going to print the same thing, printf the sum of percent %d and percent %d is percent %d. And I'll go to new line. In here, I'm going to say n1, n2, and sum. So that's my program. When I run this program, it's not going to work properly. I'm just letting you know, <laughs> OK? There is a reason for it. I just want it to fail. So when I run the program, 
See what? There is no syntax error, by the way. There is no syntax error. So if I run the program, this is what's. I said there is no syntax error. Oh, there is another thing that you need to add at the top of the of the uh, of the page. So for now, again blindly follow the instructions and right over here define this so copy that thing at the top of all your programs please okay the story is that as I told you C language is a middle level language it's not high level it's not low level when I say high level language what do I mean when I say high level language you can say pass. What is a high level language? It's like a human language. It's like a human language. What is a low level language? It's like C or assembly language? Or not C. C is not C is actually high level language. It's like closer closer to the CPU, right? Closer to the CPU, right? Okay. Because C language can act that way, okay, when you are using stuff that you are dealing with the guts of the computer, which is address of a variable. <laughs> Now it's telling you a warning. Hey, what are you doing? Yeah, this is unsafe. Are you sure you want to do this? You are dealing with. So because of that, we add that at the top. It didn't used to be there as they tried to make the programming language less shooting yourself in a the foot. They created that. So we add that thing. Just remember that. Copy it to at the top of every single code that you are writing for now until we understand really what it is. Okay. So now, now it's not going to work. That one has syntax error. Now it's going to actually compile and not work. So when I run it, it just hung. Actually, it didn't hang. It wait, it's waiting for me to enter the numbers. So if I say over here 10, enter, it goes to the next one. If I put 20, now it's going to be the sum of 10 and 20 and 30. But I didn't write a good program. Remember, when your program runs, it blindly goes through it. How the heck poor user needs knows that they are supposed to enter something. So you have to plan everything perfectly. So if I want to enter the numbers, so, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to say printf. You are, uh, uh, enter two numbers. Enter two numbers to calculate the sum. OK? And I'll do like that, and I'll go to new line. Then what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to say printf1, and I'm going to do like that. Whoa. And I'm going to do like that. Then I'm going to say printf2, and I'm going to do like that. Now if I run it, they can see what's happening. Enter two numbers to calculate the sum. One. And it's blinking. Now they know you're supposed to enter a number. They're going to say one, two, three, or whatever. Hit enter, two. Now they know the second one is going to get entered. Four, five, six, seven. And it's going to say that's the sum. Are we okay with this? Are we okay one? Are we okay two? Yes. No, you have to memorize it. No, of course you can. <laughs> I'm going to walk through it, actually. Oh, one more time. Oh, sorry, just, just uh, let me just run it. Give me a second. Now, oh, not like that. Yeah. Excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, t -t 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 F10 to walk through. I'm going to put it at left and put this one at right, and we're going to go through it step by step. Okay? Step one, variables are created. Garbage, garbage. Garbage. You see that? They're all garbage. Now a message is printed. Enter two now. Now a prompt is printed. Now value is scanned. So the control goes to the execution. Now in here I'm going to enter 10. Hit enter. Goes back to printing the next scan printf. The next prompt is printed. The next prompt is printed. And now the next scanf is executed waiting for me to enter, for example, 20. I hit enter. N1 becomes 10, N2 becomes 20, sum becomes garbage for now. As soon as I pass through it, 
sum becomes 30, and the results are printed. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? All right. Now, let me show you common mistakes that happens when you actually deal with this. By the way, I kept going over and over. You want to take five minutes break and we continue? Or you want to end early? Who wants to end early instead of a break? OK. <laughs> Most of you say, so I'm going to end at, uh, so it's 35. I'll end at 25, OK? So we'll go for another uh, 20 minutes, and we're done. Are we OK? OK. I'll do it. Two seconds. But I have to do something first. Set a timer for 20 minutes. I'll start your timer for 20 minutes. Because when I keep going, I keep going. I want to <laughs> OK. So <clears throat> scanf is a function that scans information entered from the keyboard and puts it into the address of variables. How does it work? You give it what you want to read, and you give the address exactly corresponding to that. What you see in the, it, by the way, when you are talking about printf and scanf, just to tell you the buzzwords about it, the first, because it's, it's print formatted and scan formatted, the first character string that we call it, character string, a string of characters. The first character string that is passed to the function is called the format specifier. So it specifies what is the format of printout or what is the format of reading in, okay? In this format of reading in, I am not reading any. I'm only asking for one integer. Later we'll learn what does it mean if I add stuff in here. Scanf doesn't print anything. One common mistake. One common mistake is this. People do this. They write instead of, oh, let me just go back over here. Common mistake. They, instead of writing something like this, they write, Enter number one. Enter number. Scanf doesn't print anything. That means completely different thing. If I run this, there is no way that you know how you can actually put, it, put an integer over there. OK? So you don't do that. You do not print in Scanf. Scanf's job is to read. You only put the values you want to read. Are we OK with this then to this point? OK. So I can say enter two numbers over here, and I'm going to say over here 999, 999, and put a column over here. Now I can say scanf percent %d space percent %d and put over here address of n2. I can do this. Not a very good idea, but I can. Which means I'm telling to the user to enter the first number space the second number. Now the format in which I'm reading is one integer goes in here. So when you are dealing with scanf, the arrows go the opposite direction. So essentially, the first value is an integer that is scanned and put into address of n1, and the second one scanned and put it into address of n2. Ah, OK, next time I'm going to bring my yeah, stylus, I forgot. Are we okay with this? All right, are we okay with this? All right, so now if I actually run the program, although I do not recommend this, again, the user that is sitting over there is an idiot. It's better to give them as much information as you can to make sure they understand things clearly. Okay, so what I can do over here is this. I can say, now if I run the program, they have to enter it like this. 
10 space 20. Hit enter, they're going to have 30. Okay? So that's the first, that's, that's one way to do it. Remember, they're going to do stuff like this. So you're going to see they do this. 10 and 20. They do this, it's going to go bananas. Okay, because scanf doesn't know. It's, you're saying to scanf, read an integer and read an integer, right? With a space. Scanf picks the 10 as the first one. It's happy. Now it wants to read the second D. There is A and D. What the heck is an A and D? It's not an integer. It can't scan that one. It just ex ignores it and says, you're an idiot. I'm not going to do anything. Okay? Again, you have to make sure that you, that uh, we understand that nothing happens magically. Now, the most common mistake is forgetting address of. Scanf needs the address of things to put them inside. If you do it like this, this is what's going to happen. It's giving, actually, it's giving me build error. If this was probably on matrix, it won't. I don't know. Old computers wouldn't give you that error. Old compilers. Okay? And they would just run and crash your program. Okay, and that will actually get segmentation, fault, code, dumb things like that. It, it's got, you've got to get crazy stuff coming in. So uh, now the new compilers are actually doing this. So what does it initialize? Uninitialized local variable. Oh, it says uninitialized variable. Okay, uh, I'll explain that later. So if I, if I write over here n1 is equal to 10, n2, actually 0, just put 0 in it just for the heck of it. I want this to crash. Now if I run the program, it runs, correct? So I put over here 10 and 20 and boom. Whenever you see something like this, it means you forgot some address somewhere. You forgot some ampersand somewhere. It means you told to the computer, put it in the address of N1, correct? And what did you put instead? It means go to the memory and put the variable in address 10. That's operating system. You're trying to override the operating system. It's going to prevent you if the compiler is good. And this message on matrix will be segmentation fault core dumped. OK? So when you see that, when it says segmentation fault, it means you went out of your own area. You're writing stuff outside of your program. Core dumped is actually, that's what Linux or uh, uh, this is Linux too. Uh, Unix-like operating systems do. They first tell you that you went out of your own memory. Then they get a snapshot of the memory and dump it on your hard drive. So you can actually take a look and see what went wrong in my memory if you're a geek. Okay? Make sure you delete those things. They are big values <laughs> because it's literally a dump of your memory. Okay? Make sure you delete those things. But that's a common mistake and you do not want to make. I'm going to say abort. I'm not going to say ignore. Ignore means actually start writing it. I don't want to. So that's that one. So I'm going to put it that way. And put over here address of and address of. And I'm going to say FA. What I'm going to say over here E, I'm going to say scan F. C, so it's continuation of scanf. And the next thing I'm going to tell you is functions that return values. Okay? We already know how to write different functions, right? So now I can actually write a function, say, called get integer. So I'm going to write a function called get int and it's void it doesn't receive anything because functions receive with each other when i say get int I'm get, i mean get it from user functions don't get but i want it when it gets it from user to return it out so i'm going to say return an integer it's a get int or let's make it interesting get double because we didn't do any double examples so get double by the way, this is called camel notation. This is called camel notation. You capitalize the words. That's how we do it in this class. Okay? The first one is lowercase, and all the other ones become capitalized at the beginning. So get double. Okay? So now if I want to write this code, in here I'm going to say 
double, get double, get nothing from other functions, and in here I'm going to say see, uh, uh, <laughs> printf, uh, and I'm just going to prompt. Prompt, they're going to have to show a message after this. So I'm just going to put a prompt over here, and I'm going to say, and I need a double. So at any moment, you write any function that returns something, immediately create a variable with the same type in it. So in here, I'm going to say double the value. In here, I'm going to say scanf percent %lf for the double, address of the value. Then I'm going to say return the value. As easy as that. That return zero returned it to the operating system. This one, wherever it's called, returns the value. So now what I can do over here in this program is to change these just to doubles, double, double, double. And I'm going to say enter to real numbers or floating point numbers to calculate the sum. Now, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say n1 is equal to get double, n2 is equal to get double. The sum of percent %lf and percent %lf is percent %lf because they are floats, n1, n2, and sum, and done. Okay? So, because I wrote the get double over here, down here, I have a prototype at the top. This is called prototype for get double. So essentially, because the program is compiled from top to the bottom, right? If I put the get double at the bottom, the compiler comes over here and says get double. So what the heck is that? It's not going to compile it. Well, when you introduce it up there, you say, Prototype, uh, uh, pro, uh, you say get double, it comes over here and says, aha, I have a get double. It's going to come. So you, essentially, you're introducing it. It's as if I tell you there's a tutor in the learning center helping you. If you need help, you're happy. You know there's someone that I can go for help, right? If you go over there in the learning center, there's no tutor, then you're going to give me a compiler. Hey, what the heck? You told me there's one. I was happy. It's the same thing as compiler. When compiler is, is introduced that there is a get double coming, it happily goes through. If it finishes, there is no get double, you get an error. Hey, what the heck? You told me a get double. There is none. Is that a question? Before double? I mean, at the top of this? At the top? No. Oh, I can write the whole function up there. Yeah, but usually you want the gist of everything to be right at the beginning. You don't want the main to be at the bottom. Somebody opens up your code and sees 900 lines of code before at the end it sees you just say accounting program. You know what I mean? You want the gist that uh, the whole root of everything to be at the top. Everybody, so when somebody reads this, when somebody reads this, it comes over here, okay, I'm going to get a double, get a double. So it explains what your program does. Now, if the person is interested, it's going to say, let me see how the get double works. So always have a habit of having your main at the top to tell to everyone what my program does, and the details are at the bottom. That's the whole point of functions. So we don't get involved with it. So that that's reduces the amount of confusion for us. Of course, if I wrote that function over there, hee ha and hoo hoo, then that's stupid because they don't know what it does. But when you name your function properly, the person going through your code first understand what your program is about. Then if they need to, they go to the details to see how it's actually done. Okay? So the answer is yes. I could have put the whole function up there and don't write even a prototype. But that's not a good thing. Okay? So now, if I run the program and there is no errors, there is an error. What is the error? Oh, so did I? Oh, see? See? 
See, see, see? That's exactly what I wanted to tell you. It says unsuccessful, and it says unresolved symbol get double reference in function main. I introduced it, I did it, it happily compiled it, but as soon as it finished, it saw there is no get double. Why? Because in here is get double <laughs> instead of double. I misspelled it. Okay? So if the function is not found, it's going to give me an error. But if I do it like this, now hopefully I'm not going to get an error. Enter, a, enter two floating point numbers, so 1, 2, 3.45, then 3, 4, yada, 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 yada. And it says the sum of this one and that one is this. Now walking through it will be this. I can walk it in two different ways. I can walk it as if I do not care what get, how get double works, or I can walk through it to go in detail of how, how get double works. I'm going to do them both. First of all is F10. F10 in debug, we call it step over. So it step overs, steps over of all the functions. So when I do F10 and it walks through it, it comes over here. I have all the variables with lots of garbage in it, as you see. Then it prints the thing. Now I don't want to know how to get double works. I press F10. So it steps over it. It runs it as if it's a, a, a library function, like printf. And it waits for it to get completed. I put 12.12, .12 and I hit enter. It comes out, and as you see, N2 is now 12 point. That was my point. Remember I told you it is never precise? Do you remember that? I said do not. Was it in this class and I talked about doubles and stuff? No? Many classes. So the real numbers are not precise. Remember that. Integer numbers are exact, perfectly good. If you are putting 12, it's always 12. But real numbers, because it's very tricky to hold real numbers in a computer, it keeps an estimate of it. That estimate is, is very close, but not exact. Take a look. I entered 12, 12. What's in a variable? 12.11999999. That's 12, right? But be careful about it, OK? Sometimes uh, it becomes confusing. And if I print it, it's going to actually print 12 for me, probably. We'll see. OK? So that's 12, 12. And then now I'm going to, in here, now I want to go inside and see how get double works. That's stepping into. So now I can go, if I look at the debug, you'll see step into is F11. So if I press F11 of, on, my com, com, uh, on my IDE, it goes inside get double. You see that? And it comes over here. The value is garbage. It prints the value. Now I'm pressing F10. Prints the value. Scans the value. I put 13.13. .13. I hit enter. The value becomes 13.30000001 again, an estimate but not precise. It returns that value out. So the value is returned and put into N2. So N2 is garbage. When the value is returned, it becomes 13. Now I have the sum calculated. That is actually, the other one was one less, the other one was one more. So they fixed it and now goes through it and says, that's that. Are we okay with this? So functioning returning values are like that. If we want to get, if that makes, makes the program much more simple and easy to, to deal with, okay? So you can package things that you want to repeat over and over. If I ask you to write, to receive 10 integer numbers, why writing scan of 10 times? Just write the get in, put the big scan of in there and recall your own function. Simple, straightforward, easy, and makes your life much, uh, much easier and faster. Okay? So that's that. Um, and that's it. So any questions? Again, please do not. Clutter yourself with Git stuff that I told you as Workshop Zero. I just wanted you to start it. Code with your Xcode. Code with your the way I showed you in, the, in Workshop 1. And finish your code. Make sure it works and everything. If you could submit it on Matrix, let me know. If not, book an appointment. 
I'll help you. And even if it's past due date, I'll give you the extension. But I want you to try and submit it using Git and stuff. But first, write the program. Make sure everything's good, OK? Uh, and then if you have any trouble, contact me. If not, you can simply do it as we did it in lab. Open the matrix thingy, do a nano copy and paste to it, and you're done. But if you, don't, if, if you do it through matrix and you have trouble, please have a one-to-one -one session with me so I can take you through it personally, step by step, on your computer and tell you how to do it. OK? All right? Yes, please. No, 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 it's a free format language. Okay. Try these type of questions, people. Ah, these type of questions, try it. Take a look. I could have written it like this if I'm nuts enough. It works. It goes to the next token. I just try to make it nice. But yeah, sure, that, that's, that's, if it's in the program, I don't, it, it's not, it, uh, there is no problem. Um, I usually put one space between so, we, so it's good, nicely visible. Okay? Any other question? Any question one? Any question two? Sold. Have a beautiful day. Uh, the recording will be posted uh, shortly.